Thank you for listening to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Sign up to our Patreon to receive bonus content, live streams and our weekly newsletter with money off books and museum visits as well. Plus early access to all live show tickets. That's patreon.com slash we have ways. Hi, it's Tom Holland here from the Goal Hanger sister show, The Rest is History. And I'm here to tell you about a very exciting episode. It's out today. It's all about the men who walked on the moon, the Apollo missions, the space race. And it features a very exciting special guest, none other than Tom Hanks. So that is out today. And here is a little teaser. The interesting personalities uh, of all of these crews, I think, comes out in Apollo 11, because I don't think you could have two individuals that are more different than Neil Armstrong was <laughs> yeah. from Buzz Aldrin. And you chuck Michael Collins in there, and you you have, honestly, I, I'm not sure those guys would have volunteered to, you know, drive to the beach together uh, had they not been, ass- <laughs> had they not been, a, been assigned to it. Yeah. Search The Rest is History wherever you get your podcasts to listen now. As the sky paled to the breaking of a steely winter dawn, the signal came. The company shook itself out, platoon by platoon, and we went down to the road and skirted the shoulder behind Casino. Forward we marched, cold, wet, weary and apprehensive. Rain had fallen during the night and the road was sloshy underfoot. We marched with our shoulders hunched across the raw wind, half crouched with stomachs drawn in to try and compress the disquiet of fear that seemed to knot intestines like a bald fist. Fear, fear of fear, and the shame of feeling afraid. The merciless enemy, born of memory and imagination that can twist your mind until you shrinks with the tingle of apprehension. Your palms sweat. Your arm involuntarily flinches at a remembered vision, flashed on your inner retina, of a gory sleeve with a severed arm beside it still twitching on the sand. Is any man immune? Can anyone face the imminent danger of violent death or deformity with complacency? To be disemboweled by a clamouring blast of shellfire, to be chopped in half by a streaming squirt of spandau, to be maimed and torn by a bayonet through your groin or grenade between your legs, to be blinded, to be hunted, to be shot at, and to hunt and shoot in return, to suddenly find yourself a raging berserk, crouched over a lashing tommy gun, mad with a desire to kill. That is the worst of all. Where lies the glory in such horror? And that was... I mean, and it's it's like he was in the room. Uh, Roger Smith. Yeah, I thought it was very good. 24th Battalion, the 2nd New Zealand Division. The New, Zealand's, the New Zealand accent is the tricky one for the tin-eared Englishman, of course. Um, I thought you you pulled that off. I'm, I've got to say, I thought you did that with great aplomb, and, and it sounded definitely different from an Aussie accent, <laughs> you know, which obviously, as we all know, is very different. That's indeed. the most important part. <laughs> yeah, it was, you were not an Aussie. But but that's a hell of a, that's a, hell of a line, isn't it? That's very good. It's very good. And he spends he spends some horrid days in casino. That thing about not becoming a berserker, not becoming is is a is a line a lot of men write about, isn't it? That that thing with trying to stop yourself just becoming a killer. The the rage and all that. Anyway, so um thanks for joining us. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk, Actung Actung and all that, your second world world podcast. Attenzione, attenzione. Attenzione, attenzione. This is episode six of um The Road to Rome. Our last episode was um, the German operations Fischfang und Seitensprung, um, yep. which came to nothing. And the familiar tale of the Germans uh, smashing up their own assets. And they, I mean, they did cause the Allies some trouble, but smashing up their own assets in attacks that are um, ill conceived strategically and then poorly executed tactically, I think it's fair to say. Would you agree with that, Jim? I would say your, that, yeah. Your post-match analysis. I think the Germans there. The problem is they, yeah, uh, they, they really have uh, a clear vision. Of, this is like the the rest. This is the rest is match the day meets. Yeah, second yeah, world yeah, war. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a very patchy defence. <laughs> In the end, the team wasn't really clear on what it was trying to achieve, Jim. I think yeah. that's what we can say. Tactics all over the place. In the final analysis, is Mac von Mackensen one hand held behind his back, unfortunately, by the Führer. Yeah, no, he's very much the manager of the team. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the Lair Regiment, number 11. 
<laughs> the it's the chairman that's the problem. Anyway, so um, <laughs> yeah. the Allies decide that what they're going to what they're going to do now. They're building up Anzio, four thousand tons a day. That um, is what Alex wants. The Navy can guarantee, guarantee two and a half thousand, but they've been given some LSTs. D Day is being held back by a month. It's been postponed by a month, which gives a month's breathing, breathing space for landing ships to sail round through the Straits of Gibraltar and get back to Britain for, for Overlord. But Alex is also redrawing his lines. He's tidying things up. He's going to do a two-fisted punch in the form of Operation Diadem with his assets in Italy. But what we've got to do is take Casino. And luckily, luckily, well, I mean, I did that New Zealand accent there, but luckily they got their very best people on it. I mean, just to go but just very quickly, though, just to go back to, to Alexander's plan, I mean, you know, there's, the Allies are always in a hurry because they want to end the war as quickly as possible. But but for the first time, that kind of sort of ghastly, awful kind of, right, you've got to do it really quickly, you've got to do it quickly, so, so that no one's got enough time to prepare, to kind of make proper plans, to really get the lay of the land. I mean, you know, the Texans on the Rapido, for example, you know, if everyone had just... You know, walkers down on the whole thing right from the word go and all the rest of it, but but had some other kind of wiser heads just went, okay, let's just have we got everything ready here? You know, Fred, have you kind of sorted out your kind of your your your, your fire support, all the rest of it? Had it not been all such a rush, then perhaps he might have that might have come into play. What Alexander is saying, and he's got Wilson's agreement on this, is right, we're done on operating in rain and mud. Okay, we're going to wait for the ground to dry. We're going to bring all our assets to bear. We're going to reorganize ourselves. You know, ba- Alex is a great one for wanting balance. He likes balance. Balance in his forces, balance in his plan, flexibility, you know, um, enough tactical flexibility so that if anything goes wrong, you, you know, you, you, you've got that balance to kind of to be able to kind of recover from that, et cetera, et cetera. And Operation Diadem, which he's planning, is part of that. It, it is, we're no longer going to be rushed. We're going to take our time to do this. We're going to do this properly with, with no stone left unturned. However, there is an advantage to, to, to neutralising the casino position before then because it means we can jump off straight into the Leary Valley rather than having to kind of deal with this as a kind of sort of, you know, this, this, this stubborn abscess, to coin Hitler's phrase. It would be great to have that neutralised now rather than, than then. And so if the weather allows... That's what we're going to do. And we're, but I'm not going to authorise any further attack on Casino until we've had at least three days of dry weather beforehand. Yeah, yeah. Right, over to you now, Bernard. <laughs> so, Bernard Freiberg, who, um, episode before last, um, I think we kind of, you know, laid out that the basic issue is that he hasn't really got his head around what needs to happen here or hasn't really got his head around the, the problem. And the best way to, to deal with it. He's also got, I mean, the you know, you could you could look at it from his point of view. He's got an extremely pushy and very, very, um, you know, self-confident subordinate in the form of Francis Duca, who's been going, you've been getting this wrong, boss. And you need to listen to me. Who's Who's been out of the picture because he's not been well, then returned to the picture. And he's done what he, he, he's, He's, I mean, we, I mean, I think we described him as someone who tends to agree with the last person he's spoken to. Yes, he's also got, I, I think... In fairness to Freyberg, and this is the only concession, this is the only concession I'm going to give him, is the New Zealand um, expeditionary force is not in the best of shape. And one of the problems is, is that they've been they've been overseas quite a long time. They go over in whenever it is, 1941. They're involved in the North African War, all the rest of it. And then there is what happens, uh, what, what what becomes known as the furlough scheme. So there are these two furloughs where if you've been at a certain length of time, then you get to go home for a stretch. And the idea is you go home for a stretch, you kind of recharge your boots, someone else has a go, and then you come back out again at a, a certain time. And 6,000 men are, are sent home, which equates to about 20%. The problem is that that 20% that goes home are the most experienced troops. You know, so these are your kind of your, your backbone of the platoon, the platoon sergeant and your senior NCOs, and it strips it out of it. And there's no question that the New Zealand force in the November, December battles are fine, but they're kind of sort of almost not. And, but, but they don't, well, they're fine, but they... They don't do anything spectacular, but then I suppose no one does anything spectacular in the kind of horrors and winter on, on the Adriatic coast. But what's really interesting is suddenly in January and February, when they are not doing very much, 
New Zealanders are just holding a line, the number of desertions goes up absolutely horrendously. And this is because they've suddenly got time to think and they're stuck in the snow and the mud and the rain and it's freezing cold in New Zealand. And they're thinking, hang on a minute, what the hell's going on back at home? And what's going back on home is that there is the revelation in 1943 that there's 35,000 grade A men who are still at home, who've avoided being called up. And that's because they're, they're, they're in jobs which are, inverted commas, essential industry. Well, and not only that... Um, if you go, if you're back in Wellington, there's no war on, apparently, apart from for the people whose men are away. And uh, uh, wages have gone up because there's a shortage of manpower. There's a consumer boom. Life is pretty good if you're not directly involved in the war, if your family's not directly involved in the war. And lots of men go back and, and think, why the hell should I, why the hell would I want to go back up that horrible mountainside or whatever? And they have a motto. And the motto is no man twice before every man once. Yeah, hard to argue. And with. so, basically, what these guys, these veterans, are doing is they're coming back and they're seeing these middle class types who've avoided the draft, doing kind of cushy jobs back at home, and basically avoiding the kind of slaughter that has just been described in that opening quote by Roger Smith, who's in Twenty Fourth Battalion. And the trouble is, is this filters back to the guys at Casino in letters and what have you, and newspapers and news and stuff. They hear about it. And so there is a massive rise in January and February in desertions and disgruntlement. And there is also a, a qualitative drop off because these 6,000 men are no longer, you know, who are the backbone, as they're the old timers, because they've gone back home. So the extraordinary thing is, is that, that when Alexander creates the New Zealand Corps, which, which for my money is the worst decision he makes since arriving as Commander-in-Chief of the Middle East in August 1942. I don't think he really puts a foot wrong. I think he's he's really, really fantastic in August 1942 when he takes over there and, you know, no more of no more retreats and all that kind of stuff. He's absolutely brilliant when he takes over 18th Army, um, Army Group in, in February 1943, licks Tunisia campaign into shape just like that. I think he holds a pretty good hand in, in Sicily. And I think the first few months of Italy, actually, I think he, he's done really well. I don't think the fault, any fault for the failures in the Italy campaign lie at his feet. I think they lie much higher than that, as I've said before. I think the one mistake he makes is creating the New Zealand Corps because Freyberg is, to put it bluntly, a shit for brains. He's, he's, you know, he's not the sharpest tool on the shed and he's, and he's got a, a proven track record of making absolute terrible mistakes cf crete for its start for starters and it's clear that the new zealand expeditionary force second new zealand um, infantry division is in a bit of a pickle because of the furlough mutiny because of drop of morale and all the rest of it and he doesn't have to create a core out of the new zealanders it would be much better to leave the new zealanders on the adriatic coast in a holding position so that they're not overstressed and use other units to do the hard work here. And you could have easily created an Indian corps, for example, or just called it anything you like. You could have created any corps. You know, you've got a whole of 13 brigade. You could have used it with 78th Division and 4th Indian Division or 78th Division and 8th Indian Division. You know, there are there are options. You could call it Duke Corps. Duke Corps. It could have gone for the acronym early. Well, if it had the prescience to... Yeah, exactly. It could have got, <laughs> got, got there before you did. Then, But anyway, so... so so for my money, this is this is the worst, worst decision because I don't think that the, the New Zealanders are the right people. And it's really interesting that in the in what what becomes known as the Second Battle of Casino, of Monte Casino, which is the the Indians up on the on the massive and and the New Zealand force down into, he uses two companies. Two companies are involved in that attack. That's the Maoris attacking the twenty uh, eighth Maori Battalion, um, who have much less of a morale issue, which is why they're used. And it's just, it's a mistake. You know, wh wh why is it in that whole second battle of Casino, only two companies are used for the attack on the town? And that's because Freyberg no, it, it doesn't trust them himself. And when your commanding officer doesn't really believe in you, you've got a problem. How does Clark feel about Freyberg? Well, he doesn't like him. But, but before we get to what, what Clark feels about Freyberg, so you have to then chart the... So, so, so belatedly... Freyberg has realised that Tuca was right about smothering the Monte Cassino massive. So he goes, okay, so when I when I saw Gertie, 
I said, he, he said, you need to do this and you need, you know, high capacity bombs and you need to absolutely saturate the whole area. And I didn't do that. I said 36 kitty bombers, which is the exact opposite of what, what Gertie told me. I've ma- I've realized my mistake. I'm not going to make that mistake on this battle. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to saturate Casino Town. So I'm going to, what I want from now on is I want absolute saturation and I'm going to ram that point home to the air people and to Clark and tell him that, that in future, if you want me to attack Casino Town, the only way I'm going to do it is if I completely saturate it with high capacity bombs, lots of them, completely destroy the whole thing, lots of armor lined up as well. And, and then we'll sweep in straight afterwards. The whole thing needs to be properly coordinated, which is exactly what Tuka told him to do. But if you remember, Tuka is saying, the whole Monte Cassino idea is a really bad idea. What we really should be doing is, is infiltrating up around Castel- Monte Castelloni. But if you can't do that, then you have to do this. Yeah, then you have to obliterate the place. And, yeah. and interestingly, his Freiburg's first plan for Operation Dickens is Tuka's first plan for Monte Cassino. So it is to attack north of Monte Castelloni and do a river crossing over at the Rapido. And again, this gets kicked into touch very quick order because of the the, the, the long shadow of the Texans' failed crossings at, at the Rapido. And because people say things like, yeah, but we haven't really got enough mules to go up north of Castelloni, which is just absolute nonsense because the problem with it's not it's not about the numbers of fuels, it's about congestion. So so up on Monte Cassino, you've got congestion of, of mules because you've only got these one one or two very narrow tracks. Whereas the whole point about north of Castelloni, the mountain, although it's higher and the, and the massive there is wider to get to, you know, the, the saddle is wider to get to the Via Casalina on the Liri Valley, the ground is much more open. So you haven't got these narrow ridgelines, which means that you can attack on a much broader front. You don't have to attack on just one company front down these narrow ridgelines. Which means you can overwhelm the enemy, and the over and the enemy up there is very very thin on the ground. It is it is the first Faustian Jäger regiment are holding that bit, who are the ones who have suffered the most and are the most battered, which is why they've been given the kind of you know, the easiest stretch of the line to hold. Freiburg just so so basically what Freiburg is revealing is his his total lack of of comprehension of what it was that that Tuka was driving at. And when he does start to understand what Tuka is driving at in terms of saturation of uh, of bombs, he's applying it to the wrong target. Yeah, and it's it's too late as well. That's the other thing. And the reason, and it's too late. And the reason he wants this saturation of bombing is so that he, he, the idea is that you saturate Casino Town, you completely hammer it totally. You then send the Indian divisions because... They're the mountain experts, but also then you're preserving your in, your New Zealand troops up onto the uh, up onto to kill to get get Castle Hill, which overlooks the town, and get on, and, and attack up towards the Abbey on that south steep face, which is basically like Monte Belvedere for the French, except that on the top now you've got lots of Falschenjäger bristling with machine guns, uh, mortars who are not going to c- cut and run. So so it's it's a similarly suicidal attack, but with a much tougher enemy proposition that you're facing. So it's a completely bonkers plan. But what he's trying to do here is save the lives of his New Zealander troops, who he knows are fragile. Which he knows are fragile. I mean, I mean, it's when you said when a general doesn't trust the people below him, that's a bad, that's a bad thing. Clark doesn't trust Freiburg. So, so I mean, the thing he says, the more I see of Freiburg, the more disgusted I am with his actions. He may be an extremely courageous individual, but he has no brains has been spoiled, demands everything in sight, and altogether is most difficult to handle. I mean, that's... Absolutely spot on. You can't argue with any of that. But I mean, but bloody hell, you know, if Freiburg doesn't trust the people beneath him, then Clark doesn't trust the people beneath him either. But 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 Clark has been told right at the go when, when Freiburg turns up, he's been told by Alexander, you've got to tread very, very carefully with him because this is, this is political. Yeah, which is a thing we talked about in the last episode is that politics is, politics is often the thing here. And there's lots of Falschim Jäger. There's not that many. Yeah, but no, but but in for that position, seventeen hundred, that seventeen hundred Falschim Jäger means what? I don't know, five hundred MG forty twos, plastering the place with an FG forty twos. You know, yeah, maybe maybe that's something like that. But but yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, it means a lot. But but the, but the main point is they're all Germans. They're all Germans. They're not they're not from Austria. They're not from you know they're not from from Czechoslovakia or they're not Alsatians or whatever. Alsatians, <laughs> no, none of those. Not even bearded collies either. You know, so so 
they're Germans and true. They're sort of slightly more indoctrinated than most. They've got they've got an esprit de corps, which is is absolutely evident, even if the kind of training doesn't quite back that up. Uh, and they're not going to run away. Th- that is the bottom line. And they're led by incredibly aggressive commanders like Heilmann, uh, Schultz, uh, and of course the divisional commander Richard Heydrich. You know, so so you know they're just cut from a different cloth. Not that Richard Heydrich, though. For those of you wondering, um, well, Heydrich, different- Heydrich, yeah, a different one, yeah. Um, so. Good weather on the 12th and 13th of March. 14th is also okay. So the code Bradman batting tomorrow, which is, <laughs> I mean, That's, which I love. <laughs> yeah, of course you do. Yeah. Um, and and then what happens is, is, I mean, I think this is interesting, is there's a bomb line, isn't there? And so the New, New Zealanders withdraw behind the, the, to the safety line to get out of the way of the, the bombers, which I think is really, really interesting. So already you're kind of, you're kind of seeding ground. You've got to make that up now, haven't you? Yeah, and the other the other problem about attacking Casino Town is that basically you've got the railway line, which is coming from the east. So that coming into the sort of south of the town, it sort of curves into south of the town. That's on a raised embankment. And that's the line that the Maori were taking in, in, the, in the second battle of Casino when they sent those two companies down. The problem with that, of course, is it's an even narrower front than than it is on a ridge line on, on Snake's Head Ridge or Monte Castelloni. So you're 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 canalized, you're funneled into into that approach road. Everywhere else around Casino is is waterlogged. So th- there is no other approach road apart from the north, where there's these two roads coming down, um, which is the route that the 133rd Infantry from the 34th Red Bulls were taking back in January and the very beginning of February. So you, your your access of advance is very very small. The problem is, is if you attack from the north, you've got these hills, you've got Castle Hill. Overlooking, and then you've got these series of, of of you've got the road going up to the abbey, which is a series of switchbacks and hairpins, and then you've got this knoll sticking out just be, just beneath the crest of Monte Cassino, which was where the uh, cable car was built, and that was dismantled by the Germans, in, I think October or certainly by November anyway, and it's still one of the cable car struts pylons is still sticking out and it's silhouetted against the sky. And it looks like a gibbet, so it's known as Hangman's Hill, but it's not Hangman's Hill. It's like a, it's like a little sort of rocky knoll sticking out. And so the Fourth Indian Division, and this time it's the uh, Fifth in, uh, Indian Infantry Brigade, are given the job of first of all clearing Castle Hill, then taking various various um, high points where there are these sort of switchbacks on the road, and finally also taking Hangman's Hill as a jump off point before you then attack the Abbey. But as I say, you're attacking it up the kind of steepest side, the steepest approach. And overlooking the town, and this is all about all about watching the flank of the New Zealanders as they go into the town, behind which has then been demolished. And the whole idea is that you saturate the the town, and you're through and clear by that evening. So the, the infantry is just doing a mopping up job. And so what 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 Freiburg is trying to do is protect the asses of his New Zealand troops. Yeah, yeah, in a very big way. Let's do the first day of the battle and then we'll and then we'll go to the break. So it starts off at 8:30 in the morning, uh 15th of March. I mean 992 tons of bombs are, are delivered. I mean that's yep. 164 B24s, 114 B17s, 105 B26s, 72 B25. That's a lot. And then another 260 heavies are meant to come in the afternoon and they're stopped because of the cloud and smoke coming off the off the target. Yeah, and I mean, I mean there's film footage of this because everyone watches from a hill. Um, a few a few miles away, it is the most extraordinary thing. I mean, it is, it is absolutely brutal, and it is saturation bombing. It is the first time the Allies have tried saturation bombing of a town, or a city, or you know, or or, or any kind of built up area. And you're getting into kind of you're you're getting into the whole kind of sort of fibula stuff, you know, fighting up in built up areas, and 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 you know the problems of having, you know, short horizons and stuff if you've got lots of buildings in the way. The truth of the matter is, though. Is that casino is already broken? So, so there is not a single civilian living there. It's been cleared out the previous autumn. It, it is a ghost town already. It is already a, a, a town that is shattered. Is, is is you know there's barely a building that hasn't been hit. So this is this is the coup de grace of a of a of a town that has already been destroyed. Even so, there is something about. The saturation of Casino Town, which is which sits, I think, very uncomfortably. It is so brutal in, in, in its destruction. The, the photographs of, of of Casino, kind of, you know, in the autumn of nineteen forty three, and the photographs of Casino in the middle of March nineteen forty four, 
it's really shocking. It, I mean, it is just completely wiped from the face of the earth. But the Falchim Jäger aren't, though, are they? That's the um... well, a lot of them are. But you know, 160 out of 300 of of the second battalion of Falchim Jäger regiment, which is Mad Ludwig Hellman's mob, who we met in Sicily, and you know, Primasoli and all that. 160 of them are killed, but but not all of them, no. And and you know, I I knew a guy called Jupp Klein. He was an engineer. He was in the engineer, um, the Pioneer Battalion of the First Falchim Jäger Division, and you know, they were doing mainly what they were doing was building tunnels connecting cellars so that you could go from you could protect the road you could take the via casalina highway six it runs from the east into the town then does a 90 degree dog leg and turns southwards into the leary valley and all along there that you then got you've then got the the houses on the kind of lower slopes of monte casino and so the the connection is between is under the road between cellars and up into those up into those higher buildings so you can then emerge into kind of machine gun posts and, and cover the via casalina they've made a fortress of it basically the, they've the, made a fortress the, of it a labyrinthine underground fortress i mean think hamas in gaza yeah yeah and so the, the, then there's artillery at midday the kiwis start moving forward with tanks in a in accompaniment but they obviously they get stuck in the they get stuck in the town but they get about two thirds of it they, they get through very quickly the first two thirds and they get up to the Via Casalina as it's coming from the east. But Jim, you can't be two thirds pregnant, can you? I mean, this is the thing. They need to take the whole <laughs> they, need, they need to go hundred percent. They have to take the whole town, don't they? And they don't. And this is the this is the thing when t- you know, so often that if you're held up, you're held up if you're held up at all, you're held up forever in these circumstances, right? Because getting started again is the really hard part. Um so first fourth Essex take Castle Hill, but not until the early hours of the of the of the next day. So sort of uh, in the middle of the night. First six Rajputana rifles, they're attacking 0.236 early on the 16th. So there's a dog leg, there's a hairpin by the castle, and then it goes round again and then it comes back. So 0.236 is the next hairpin above Castle Hill. They put an attack, but they have to withdraw to Castle Hill. And, I mean, this is interesting, that their headquarters is wiped out, which is bad luck. I wonder if that's because they have a radio set with a 12-foot high radio aerial and have, have unfortunately made themselves visible to you know people looking yeah one of the other problems is 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 that the the first knife gurkhas which is the third battalion of the of the the fifth indian infantry brigade they're moving up from from cara the village of cara which is just to the north sort of just, just beneath kind of uh monte belvedere takes them five hours to get to their start position because the routes down are clogged by new zealanders getting in the way and so they have to fight their way through congestion. They then do, and then then two of their companies just vanish overnight. No one knows where they are until at dawn. They suddenly see them. They're on Hangman's Hill. They've got to. They've got to the cable. They've car. got there. But then the weather intervenes because the weather gets a vote, casting vote, and it's torrential rain. Yeah, it's absolutely. It hoofs it down. Yeah, and so it's not the sort of straightforward. We we batter them. We batter the abbey. We batter the town, and then we simply, you know, the Germans throw in the town, and on we move. That has not happened. We will take a very quick break, and then we'll be back with the 16th of March to find out how much change there is by the end of day two. See you in a second. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. That was the 15th of March, the first day of Freiburg's attempt to prize the Germans out of Monte Cassino. And it's gone, it's been a curate's egg, isn't it? It's gone well in, it's good in parts, isn't it? Is the truth? Yeah. Uh, as I say, they, they've, they've got up to the kind of Via Casalina as it's coming from the West, uh, around the what used to be known as a Continental Hotel. Uh, it's obviously just rubble now. The Indians have done really, really well, which just goes to show their prowess as mountain, mountain fighters. I mean, the, the infiltration of, of the first knife Gurkhas up onto Hangman's Hill is absolutely astonishing. But, you know, this is this is what happens also when you can move stealthily and when your enemy can't see you. Because one of the things, actually, advantages of going up a really, really steep hill is that quite often your enemy don't have the angle of fire. You know, if they're in dug in on, on positions, they can fire down to the town, but they can't actually fire down the slopes because the angle's too great. And, and they're not in, in the right positions and all the rest of it. And it's an amazing achievement. And they stay up there. The Germans don't don't push them off. Um, 
day two is 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 one of those days it's a bit like fish fang day two and and sight and sprung day two that you know if it hasn't worked on the first day chances are it's not going to really work on the second day either yeah yeah because yeah, yeah, yeah. the moment of surprise is gone you've now got your landscape that's been obliterated by bombers you know where you are it's wet and miserable everyone's cold and the only way you're going to really really push through is by the new zealand infantry really 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 hammering and, and being very very aggressive and the truth of the matter is they're just not really because by the end of play on the 17th of march so day three the new zealanders have, has, have lost only 130 men and 12 tanks right you know against you know 150 germans so it's kind of you know, i don't want to cast any sort of you know Dis, dis the New Zealanders, but but there is a kind of feeling that they're not quite as gung ho as they might be. But they're up against people who have who have prepared a, a, a fantastic defense. It's a fantastic defensive scenario, isn't it? If you're the if you're the Falschenberger in here, it's it's ideal, isn't it? If well, it's ideal if what you want to do is fight to the last round and make the enemy pay, which is which is what they're doing, right? Yeah, but you should, you should have, you know, with that amount of, you know, with, with a whole division and, and all those tanks. Okay, the problem is you can't get the tanks in because the only tanks that have got in are the tanks that have got in on the afternoon of the 15th because everything else is too waterlogged. You can't get through and the bulldo- and the dozers can't work. You probably could sort of swarm that with men, but there's congestion, there's a lack of leadership, there's a lack of will, there's all that kind of stuff. You know, the, the reinforcements all the time in this battle are really slow at coming up. It's almost like, there's no, so urge, there's urgency. There's no drive. You know, they're not kind of like right. We got to exploit it. And of course, what happens, of, of, of course, is is that, you know, overnight on the on the sixteenth, you know, they manage to get um some more troops down. They you know they shift some troops from the Abbey area down into the town. They're moved down, um, and then eventually von Wedekalf and Kastering say, right, you know, you need reinforcements. And Heydrich's like, yeah, okay, I'm going to have reinforcements. I'm not having them in the town. We'll put them on the site. We'll put the 150 Panzer Grenadier infantry. You know, up on some of the quiet spots, and I'll shift my my fashion rig around. You know, I'm not having that, and and so it just it becomes you know day three, the 17th of March. It's just a kind of you know it's it's like a sort of slow slog. They're making kind of very very slow headway in Casino. They do kind of push south and get the, the railway station, and, and they're closing in on that kind of Continental Hotel, which is right that sort of two thirds of the way through. But they're not making a decisive breakthrough, and and and. The enemy defence is solidifying rather than loosening. Yeah, you're flies on flypaper in that environment, aren't you? In that in that landscape, if you're not careful. Yeah, it's pretty horrendous. Saturday, the eighteenth of March, day four. The Germans. I mean, the, and the other things. The Germans are counterattacking there. They're trying to win back Castle Hill. They're still, you know, they can't help themselves. It's the first fourth Essex in there. I remember meeting Bill Hawkins. He was involved in that. He was a lovely chap. Um, yeah, and I, and again, it, it just always shows you that it's just so much harder counterattacking than it is attacking. I mean, rather than it is defending. That's that's the point. Defend, defense is easy, um, is straightforward because you know where you are, you know what your parameters are, and you haven't got to expose yourself. You can hide, but the moment you attack, you've got to get up out of those positions of hiding and and move in on open ground. So it all becomes night fighting stuff. Really, this is where it's all kicking off. Is at night. Um. Well, because I mean, it's the thing we talked about in the last episode. Is that you know the, the the defender doesn't need to take the initiative in in that regard. No, if you're attacking, it all gets. I mean, it's, we talked about this before in Normandy. Is that attacking is attacking is hard, defending is the, the defending is the way to go, isn't it? If what you're trying to do is hold the other side up, then the, the Sunday the nineteenth, day five, Freiburg decides on a. He wants to coordinate his attacks rather than have this sort of chipping chipping away thing. So um, 4th Indian Division are to reinforce the Gurkhas on Hangman's Hill and then assault the Abbey. And then a force of tanks also to scale the Cavendish Road and get in around the back of the Massif. I mean, well, now we're, we're talking about getting around the back of things now rather than simply bashing yourselves against them. Yes. Well, I mean, this is the Cavendish Road, which has been forced out, which has been, been hewn out of the... It's a, basically, it's a mule track that has been widened to be able to take a tank up there. It's the most extraordinary achievement. This is done... Um, up to the start of the battle by the by the Indian sappers um, from Fourth Indian Division, it, it is an absolutely incredible achievement. And interestingly, you can still walk it to this day. It's 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 still there, just about. It's it's a really good walk to do. The problem with it is that you 
from an engineer, the engineering feat point where where it's been blasted out of the side of the hill. That's that's the kind of really really impressive point from an engineering perspective, and that bit all works fine because you're kind of out of out of sight for most of it. The problem is, is you then emerge between Monte Castelloni and Snake's Head Ridge or the Colli My, um, Myola into kind of the first of a sort of series of sort of mountain pastures. There's kind of sort of weird, one of these sort of weird mountain plateaus up there, even if I, you know, in, sandwiched between the ridge. And you, you could advance up there and that's quite wide and open and that's all fine. But then there's this weird bottleneck at the end of Phantom Ridge, which is one of the spurs that comes off Castelloni before you reach Albanetta, which is this sort of weird monastery buildings and sort of farm beyond that. And the bottleneck is just, you can't do it because the bottleneck is at a crest. So it, it suddenly narrows as it rises. And at some point you've got to go over a kind of sort of very narrow stretch and then drop down again. And obviously the moment you go through that, you're in, you're in stuck. You're in trouble. But, I mean, it's interesting. What Heydrich then has planned is a, is a strong counter. I think it's fascinating. They can't. They just cannot help themselves, can they? He, he's going to bring in a fresh battalion of 4th Falsham Jaeger. They're going to attack first light on the 19th of March. Yeah, but, but let, let, let's not say, you know, when we're talking about a fresh battalion, we're talking about 80 men. We're not talking about 800. But, of course, but this determination to, I mean, you know, he's going to waste them, those people, aren't they? It's, it's just this, it's this... You're in a strong position here. Why weaken it? You know, because in the and your strong position depends on well motivated soldiers. So don't spaff them up the wall, as to use a, a Johnsonian expression, about uh, on a, on a counterattack that's not going to work. I mean, it's not going to work, is it? This is the thing. You know. Well, it sort of works. It sort of works because it does cock up the Fourth Indian's plans. Yes, it discombobulates Fourth Indian, but it's but it's not like. What's it actually going to achieve? Well, I've got a better plan, which is put lots of machine guns and mortars all around the abbey at the top and try and come and take us if you like. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, when you attack us to take the Ab- Monastery Hill, um, we'll just shoot at you rather than us getting out of our foxholes and our, our MG posts and coming to get you. It's very, very... I mean, it's the mentality is strange, isn't it? But as you say, 4th Indian then, they cancel. Interesting, isn't it? Like a, a, a scrap of a battalion holding up a division. In that instance, um, the New Zealanders that they attack the Continental Hotel that doesn't work. Tanks are sent in and they take point five nine three. But by the time it's done, Seventh Brigade have been written down too much to make the most of it. So the, the lead Sherman tank hits hits the mine, blocks the blocks the bottleneck, yeah. and it's that's you know, the end of that. Yeah, that's the end of yeah. that. So all that effort, all that time, and you know, it's just it's just it's, it's bonkers. And, and and this is why it's so frustrating because there is another plan. Which is to go further north around Monte, north of, between Castelloni and and and. I mean, I'm I'm actually going to go and walk this in May because I I really want to feel completely hundred percent satisfied that I've got this right. But by looking at it on the ground and looking at it from, I mean, I've been up on on Colle Sant'Angelo, I've been up on on, on Castelloni before. I've looked across. I've looked every which way you can on 3D Google Earth. You can see these 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 slug like. Narrow ridges going across the Monte Cassino Spur, Monte Castelloni leading into Colle San Angelo and forking off into Phantom Ridge, and then obviously the the spur which leads en- ends with the with the kind of rocky knoll of of point five nine three. You can see the land, and it's just so much more open further north, north of Castelloni. That is the route. That's what you want to take. This idea that there aren't enough mules—that's just absolute horseshit. That that's finding a reason not to do something rather than. Finding a solution. Yeah. It's absolutely crazy. I mean, it's interesting, though, because after, you know, it's, it's a long stretch they've been stuck here. You might start finding reasons not to do things. The idea that it's impossible might creep in, right? Yeah, but, but you'd have thought the, mo- the impossible bit is, is sort of Snake's Head Ridge and, and the Casino Spur and going through the town. I mean, the town, the, the attack on the town is clearly a one trick. It's a one card operation. Saturate the town, send the troops in. Sweep through, be out the other side by six thirty that night. If you haven't, if you haven't, if that hasn't worked, it's not going to work. You're done. It's battering at the same problem, same brick wall, but with diminishing assets. That's that's the problem. Which is, after all, um, what we talked about in the last episode with the Germans attacking the salient in in Anzios. If you you know day one, unless it works on day one, it, it's not going to work. So then, um, the ninth, night of the nineteenth, twentieth, the Germans reinforce one hundred fifteenth Panzer Grenadier. They come in. 
um, and the Fallschirm Jäger are redeployed to infiltrate into the town along the mountainside. So suddenly you've increased the number of Germans that are in Casino Rubble. Yeah. And their artillery and mortars become more, more active. So, more, you know, the Germans are increasing in confidence here is what this tells us, actually. So yeah. The Germans are feeling more confident about what they're doing and they're prepared to... Because after all, you know, the minute you start firing your artillery and your mortars, maybe you're going to get counter counter mortared and counter artilleried. So they've clearly got confidence in what they're doing to prepare to be prepared to risk those guns and mortars. I mean, it's very interesting, isn't it, that, that what you've got is the confidence draining out of the Allies and into the Germans. Yes, there's a little bit of that going on. Definitely. If there's a quantity of uh, confidence to be had. And then the 20th of March, day six, Alex has a look, decides if there's no improvement within 30, 36 hours, he's going to call it off and consolidate the ground gained. Which, which, to be fair, is not insignificant. I mean, you know, holding Castle Hill, that's important. Holding two-thirds of the town, you know, when you when you got to jump up. I mean, that, that, that is better than having none of the town. I mean... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it dries out and the, and the potholes empty and you get the bulldozers in and stuff, you know. So, so you know, it's not that that's, that's not useful. It's, it's, it's not... It hasn't been a total waste of time. It's just... It's not working that is a problem and and you know i think i think alex Hunter's point is you know we've got to be careful we, get, we don't want to kind of sort of deplete two of our divisions here who we might need for for diadem and let's circle back there's been a morale problem in italy for quite a while if you bang your head against a brick wall and there is an argument that a lot of the issues the kiwis are having here is because of a morale problem and because of a, an extended morale problem where, you know, these guys in their mailbags, they're going to have their wives going, there's a mutiny going on back here. Why are you still there? You know, people have had enough. They're going to know about it, even though the New Zealand government did its damnedest to conceal the, the furlough mutiny. But, they, you know, they, they, wouldn't have, they wouldn't have kept it out of people's mailbags. I'm sure, I'm sure of it, right? And this is, you know, Jonathan Fennell's research, isn't it? And, and so if, if you're Alex and you're thinking, we just got to be careful, we have just got to be careful morale-wise, you know, if you lose too much... You might think you, you, the men might think there's no point. You're never going to win. So you you can you can see there's lots of reasons to stop. And also there is this interesting the Allies are now able to consider stopping. As we said at the start of this episode, it's up to this point it's been about push 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 push. Regardless, here's Alex going. No, actually, you know what? We can afford to stop now. Or well, we're better off stopping. We're better off pausing. So on the 23rd of March, it's called off. First Ninth Gurkhas are recalled from Hangman's Hill. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. They've been stuck there and they've been doing a kind of sort of um, Felix Sparks act up on the, up on, on, on Hammond's Hill, sort of, you know, refusing to budge and... Hanging on in there. Hanging on in there. Um, Sorry, lads, it's off. And, and the truth is that the Germans can't really get at them because there's, because it is this kind of little knoll. They're kind of stuck on the sides and the edges and, and behind it and they can sort of hide quite quite well in the rock up there. They just can't can't get to them. But obviously, you know, they've, they've, they've suffered casualties, don't get me wrong. I mean, they have. I mean, it, it is an amazing effort to get up there. It really, really is extraordinary to get to get there in the first place. Yeah. But what are the losses from this battle? Total losses, uh, all casualties, and that includes sort of, you know, wounded and what have you, is 4,000 men right, from two divisions, which is a lot. But as I say, you know, the, the interesting thing is, is the first bit, by the end of the 17th of March, New, Ze New Zealanders have only lost 130 men, which is not very many at all. No. It's obviously further attrited the, 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 the Germans. You know, First Faustian Jäger is, is bashed again. I mean, it's not good for First Faustian Jäger division at all. I mean, yeah, but they being, like being bashed. Let's face it. Let's face it. If you're, if you're First Faustian Jäger, the thing you really want is to be smashed up by the Allies. And <laughs> that's your bag. Look across the rubble to one another with your cheroot and say, "Here we go again, Hans." And yeah. then uh, you know, one more time for the fatherland. Surely, I mean, what else? What's motivating them? These are guys are co completely, you know, have become just war people, haven't they? They're just they are they are warriors. Well, that, interestingly, yeah. I mean, one of, one of the one of the very exciting people we got coming on at some point, and um, who is coming to we have Waste Fest is Magnus Paul, who is a German academic and who has written a book on Casino, and, and which he basically rubbishes the reputation of the Fallschirmjäger, which is very exciting. <gasps> He says that basically they're a, they're a Goebbels propaganda thing. And not, but Jim, and, we can't and, end up and, with the thing is we're going to end up with a point where absolutely everyone's crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they're clearly not crap. They're not crap compared to compared to others, um, and <laughs> they're disciplined and motivated. I think that's yeah. the point. I think I think that's the key. You know, the, 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 people use sort of the term elite troops just a little bit too freely. 
a bit too freely, yeah. And and you know, there's obviously there's a lot of guys who are coming through who who are coming into the ranks who aren't particularly brilliantly well trained or, or particularly amazing. But what you've got is you have still got this cutter. You've got you've got people like Rudolf Kratzert, who 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 was um you may remember was the guy who was whose troops kind of got shoved up and he only had two hundred and thirty six men and four officers and they were put onto Albonetta and point five nine three and kind of resisted everything that came their way. And, you know, these and, and that's because he's very clear headed. He's he's absolutely you'd follow him to battle every single time. You know, he's one of your your gung ho types. But they're also you can't put a price on experience. And that's the big thing that there's enough in the first Falschnegger division still to really to be able to kind of sort of osmosis effect kind of through those recruits and and, and cre- create a kind of a culture and a, a esprit de corps and all the rest of it. And that that absolutely unquestionably exists. And they're not having to uh, they're not having to attack. And they're not having to attack. You know, which is well, it's that you're when you're doing counterattacks on on Castle Hill or whatever. Well, so uh, clearly Monte Cassino unfinished business. That's the that's the uh, the truth of it. Um, they've tried but they failed. Join us in our next episode. And hopefully you're listening to this on our Apple channel. And that means you you can listen to this all in one great big splurge. I mean, God knows how long a walk you'd have to go to listen to this all in one go. I mean, get off, whatever you're doing, get off that exercise bike. If you've put this series on and you're on the exercise bike, get off now because there's no way we're going to, I mean, you're, you know, you're going to do yourself a mischief. Anyway, if you're on the Apple podcast where you can subscribe and do the, the advertising or join us on our Patreon, we have ways of making you talk Patreon where there's all sorts of extra trickles of goodies and bits of news and offers and stuff, bits and pieces. And then, um, of course, come to our festival on the 18th, to 21st of July. We have ways of making you talk fest where you can shake hands with us, buy us a pint and say, you know what? I think you're a bit harsh on Bernard Freiburg, which I'm fully expecting the Anzac Cove Jake Hayward to do if he joins us this summer. Anyway, we will, we will see you all very, very soon. Thanks for listening and goodbye. Farewell. Farewell.